we have now seen the deep connection between the angular momentum operators on one hand and the way a system, a quantum mechanical system behaves under rotations of coordinates on the other hand. Now, one result from angular momentum theory which you must recall from your earlier courses is that angular momentum or at least orbital angular momentum components do not commute. Right? Lx, Ly, Lz have a non-trivial commutator and uh, you could easily figure out what that commutator was from the fact that Lx was ypz minus zpy, Ly was zpx minus xpz and, uh, and we already knew that x, y, z and p, x, y, p, z has a definite commutation relation between them. So, you must all recall that Lx, Ly commutator is actually ih cross times Lz and the relation is cyclic. Ly, Lz commutator is ih cross times Lx and so on. Now, this uh, seems to be a direct result of the basic form which the angular momentum operator takes in this case. Rem remember this is the case where we are talking about operators which act on wave functions which are functions, simple functions of x, y, z. And as we have already said there are quantum mechanical systems where the states are described by more complicated objects. No matter how complicated the objects are they have to be elements of vector space but they could be very much more complicated or abstract elements of vector space. And the angular momentum operator for such situations would also be very much more complicated or at least different. So it may come as a surprise to you that even in such cases the commutation relations between angular momentum components stay exactly the same. But it is really not a reason to be, there is no reason to be surprised here. Uh, the fact that the angular momentum operators do not commute is a direct consequence of a very simple mathematical fact, a simple geometrical fact. The fact that rotations themselves, rotations of coordinates, do not commute. Now this is a very famous picture which you have seen perhaps before. I have taken this from a book by Benjamin Crowell on general relativity. It is an open source free book available. And this essentially star shows, the, shows the fact that two rotations about two different axes do not commute. So you start with a physics text lying flat on a table and these three axes x, y and z have been marked. Now if you rotate 90 degrees about x first, the book turns and now faces you. Remember the y-axis still points vertically up and now if you rotate 90 degrees about the y-axis, the book turns until it is facing in this direction. Now what happens if you were to do the same rotations but in the other order? You, if you first turn through 90 degrees about the y-axis, then the book turns counterclockwise when it's seen from the top and it's now still flat on the table but has been turned around. Now the x-axis is still remember in this direction so when you rotate 90 degrees above the x-axis the book now turns to face you while lying on its edge. Notice that this is the result of a 90 degree rotation about x and then a 90 degree rotation about y. The lower one here is a result of a 90 degree rotation about y followed by a 90 degree rotation about x. And the two results are entirely different. So starting from the same initial state, two successive rotations, the same two successive rotations about the same axis to the same angle but at in different orders lead to entirely different results. So there are of course different combined rotations. Now let us put this thing into a bit more of maths and let us do this for an arbitrary angle. Now if you did not know this already it's pretty easy to figure out that the rotation matrices acting on three dimensional coordinates for rotations through an angle theta about the x axis and the y axis are given by these matrices. They are very very similar 
to the root matrix R Z theta we had, which we had talked about at the very beginning, uh, except for the fact that X Y Z have been cyclically interchanged. So the rows of this matrix have been cyclically permuted. Rows and columns. Now armed with these matrices, we are going to do a quick mathematical calculation. I'm going to ask what happens if I rotate through an angle theta 1 about x-axis first and then rotate through an angle theta 2 about the y-axis. Or rather, the question that I'm asking here is, the op is really the opposite question. I'm rotating through theta 2 about the y-axis first. Remember the one acting on the sitting on the right axis first. And then I'm rotating about the x-axis through an angle theta 1. And just to make the whole thing fit into the screen, Instead of cos theta 1, I use C1, sin theta 1 is S1, etc., etc. here. Now, this is a matrix multiplication which can be carried out very easily, but I'm pretty sure you will not be able to follow this on the screen. It's best that you take out pen and paper yourself and work it out. The result works out to be this one. Notice, uh, it's pretty easy to do the matrix multiplication, so I'm not going to elaborate on this, but it's always good to be able to work it out yourself rather than rely on my word for it. Now this was a rotation about the y-axis to theta 2 first, then a rotation about the x-axis to theta 1. What happens if we do this in a different order? That is rx theta 1 first, then ry theta 2. Of course all that happens is these two matrices sitting here gets interchanged and once again, the matrix multiplication is pretty trivial, takes a while to do, but it's rather easy to see that this is what you get. As you can see clearly that these two matrices are not the same. There's a 0 sitting here and S1, S2 sitting here for example. So if you subtract these two matrices, what you get, of course, is not the null matrix. It's, the result is pretty straightforward. This is what you get. Notice that all the diagonal elements are zero. It sort of looks like an anti-symmetric matrix, but it's not really anti-symmetric. These two elements are the same. This one is, has opposite sign, this pair. Um, it is quite an interesting question as to exactly what happens to this matrix under transposition. Uh, I would urge you to figure that out in general. So this is the general result that two, oper two rotations carried out one after the other um, does not commute and the commutator AB minus BA is of this particular form. What is going to be very much more interesting actually is that if we take a look at this result in the limit when the angles of rotation involved are very very small. Both theta 1 and theta 2 are to be replaced by epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 and we are going to take epsilons as very small. Uh, as you can see, all these terms here are actually higher than the first order. This is the first, second order term, This so is this. Now this has only one epsilon 2, but notice that 1 minus c1 is actually epsilon 1 square by 2 and plus higher order terms. So this term actually is cubic in epsilon. So is, so is this, this, this. So to the first order in small angles, the commutator vanishes. And it shows up as a non-zero result only at the second order. And the second order term, if you just retain up to the lowest non-trivial order, the second order, this result actually becomes very, very simple. It simply becomes this. Notice that these elements, while they were non-zero, this one here, this one here, and their corresponding ones on the other side of the diagonal, they were non-zero for finite angles, but for infinitesimal angles, they're actually third order. So if you're keeping up to order two, this is all you get. Plus, of course, third order corrections. Oh, before that, let us just point out that this matrix is actually not... Um, very unfamiliar. If you put it put once here, this would really be a rotation matrix for rotation about the z axis 
to a tiny angle epsilon 1 epsilon two, minus epsilon 1 epsilon 2 so this really is the identity matrix from which you subtract the relation matrix for epsilon 1 epsilon 2 once again this algebra is best done with pen and paper uh, but it's pretty straightforward so the commutator between two infinitesimal rotations about the x and y axis turns out to be almost the identity operator but the difference between that and the identity operator is a rotation about the z axis through a second order angle the angle epsilon 1 epsilon 2 now as i was saying hmm, r1 corresponds to u1 r2 corresponds to u2 implies r2 r1 corresponds to u2 u1 this means that this result will actually correspond in the in terms of the operators acting on the Hilbert space to this result ux epsilon 1 ux epsilon 2 minus u y epsilon 2 ux epsilon 1 that is each of the r's which were acting on rotation space is replaced by u's which act on the Hilbert space of states and here is of the identity 3 by 3 identity matrix you will get the identity operator and the rest so this is what you have to get So the result that we have here is that the geometry of rotations, the fact that rotations about the x and the y axis do not commute, leads us to the statement that rotations about the x axis and y axis, or rather the operators corresponding to the rotations about the x and the y axis acting on Hilbert space, they also do not commute and they do not commute in a very specific way. We know what their commutator is. Now, we also know that you can write down, at least for small angles, ux epsilon 1 and uy epsilon 2 in terms of angular momentum operators. What is important is that I cannot write down these operators only up to order epsilon. Why? Because uh, after all, the result that I am looking for, the correction term is of the order of epsilon square. So I have to write down each, each individual operator, not just up to order epsilon, but up to order epsilon square. But we have already known that for even large angles, the rotation operator is the exponential of i by h cross times epsilon times the angular momentum component. So up to second order is just the next term here. So this is what ux epsilon 1 is. And a similar expression works for u y epsilon 2. Of course, all this is correct only up to order epsilon square. There are order epsilon cube corrections in both of these pieces. So there is an overall order epsilon cube correction. Now what we need to do is figure out what this quantity is when you multiply it out. But once again, only up to order epsilon square. The order epsilon to the zero term is very easy. It's identity times identity. The linear terms can be obtained by multiplying this operator sitting here, the linear operator, the operator linear in epsilon with the identity here and this operator again linear in epsilon with the identity here. The quadratic pieces, epsilon square pieces can be obtained by taking this times identity, this times identity and one more piece which comes by multiplying these two first order terms together, this one and this one. So when you multiply this out to order epsilon square, this is what you get. Up to this is really not very interesting, but what is the interesting part for us is this. The term that I get when I multiply the first order epsilon 1 term here with the first order epsilon 2 term here. Sorry, not this one, this one. And this is a term which I have written down in magenta. The reason why we have done that is if we now calculate this product of the same two operators taken in the, in the opposite order, that is the blue and the red brackets here, switch, it's very easy to see that the result is exactly the same. The only difference 
is the, these two factors is of this factor and this factor you get this one first the blue one first and the red one next and you end up with this product almost exactly similar except that instead of jx jy in the previous factor you have jy jx here so what is the difference between the two everything cancels up to order epsilon square except for this one term if we subtract you get j minus coming from the i square by h cross square epsilon 1 epsilon 2 times jx jy minus jy jx the commutator between jx and jy so up to order epsilon square the commutator of the operators ux epsilon 1 and uy epsilon 2 is nothing but a term proportional to the commutator between jx and jy however we already know in addition to this that the right hand side identity minus uz epsilon 1 epsilon 2 must be identity minus whatever this operator is and in order to get the ordered epsilon square correction to this expression all I need to do is use the first power term in terms of angles in uz because the angle already is quadratic and if we do that this is what comes out notice that these two operators the one here and the one here while they are not exactly the same they have to agree up to order epsilon square as a result the epsilon square order term for both of them must match and this immediately gives us the result that jx jy the commutator has to be ih cross jz we can proceed similarly taking rotations successively about the y and the z axis and in, then in the other order z on the x axis and in the other order and end up with the other two commutation relations in exactly the same way the upshot of all this is you are getting back the familiar angular momentum commutation relations despite the fact that here you have made no statement about what jx jy jz are in terms of other operators whose commutation relations you know so unlike the case of orbital angular momentum where lx ly lz uh, were known in terms of x y z p x p y p z and from that from the commutation relations between position and momentum you figured out the commutation relations for orbital angular momentum components here we are doing that simply by using the basic structure of space that is basic structure basic geometry of space just from the fact that rotations about the x and the y axis do not commute and exactly how they don't commute we can figure out what the commutation relations are so no matter how complicated the system no matter how abstract your definition of angular momentum operators are the commutation relations between jx jy jz must always be jx jy commutator is ih cross jz and so on so the commutation relations between angular momentum operators follow from geometry irrespective of the detailed structure of the operators this is the most important take home take home lesson from the theory of rotations and angular momentum